Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our monthly Vet Chat. Vet Chat is an exclusive live web series that gives you a front row seat to an intimate exchange with our Vietnam veteran volunteers. My name is Melissa Ziobro, and I am the Specialist Professor of Public History at Monmouth University and a trustee here with the New Jersey Vietnam Veterans Memorial Foundation. Some quick housekeeping notes about today's Vet Chat. Today's program is being recorded and will be shared on our website, YouTube, and social media. We have turned off the chat feature in this webinar, but we encourage you to ask questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We are also monitoring comments from the Facebook Live broadcast. We'll do our best to get to as many questions as we can during today's program after I ask some initial questions of our veteran guest. So about an hour interview and then Q&A. There will be a brief survey at the conclusion of today's program asking for your feedback and any messages you would like to pass on to today's veteran. If you are on the Zoom, this will pop up automatically when you close your Zoom screen. And if you are on Facebook, the link will be posted in the comments. So let's get started. Joining us today is Billy Terrell, who is a tour guide at the Memorial. Welcome, sir. Hi, how are you? Good, good. So to start, can you please tell us first the years you served in the military? Okay, I drafted in 1965. I uh, yeah, went in uh, on August 5th uh, and uh, I went to Vietnam the end of May of 66. I uh, left Vietnam May 29th, 1967 and got home a few days later with the time changes. I, I basically served 22 months because I had leave uh, uh, built up, and uh, when I when I got back to Fort Lewis, Washington from Vietnam, uh, if I took the 30 day leave, then I would only have like a week or so to go. So they just they uh, I was discharged and went on home. <laughs> okay, and just a little housekeeping: your branch, unit, and rank. Uh, U.S. Army. Uh, we started out as the 96th Quartermaster from Fort Riley, Kansas. We went over as a battalion on the USS Walker. And when we got to Cameron Bay, Company A stayed in Cameron. Company B was redesignated the 226 Supply and Service. And uh, my rank when I uh, left was E4, Specialist 4. Okay, so we've got those technical details down. Let's start our conversation talking just a little bit about your early life for some context. Where and when were you born and raised? I was born in Newark, New Jersey on November 14th, 1944. Uh, lived in Newark uh, sometime with my grandmother. And then we also lived on North 6th Street until about 1950, late 1950. And then my father built a home in uh, Belleville, New Jersey. And we were there about in Belleville about two years. And unfortunately, uh, he went broke and we moved to the shore, Jersey Shore. And I spent the, from 1952 to 1960 in Belmar. And then, you know, moved from there. Okay. What was your childhood like? Well, Looking back, interestingly, at the time, except for the bullies and everything, and because uh, I we were we really bottomed out. Uh, we moved almost every six months. Uh, my father had difficulty uh, providing. I think he was demoralized when I look back on it now. Uh, not excusing him, but I, I've made my peace with it. But the childhood was, uh, it, it was uncomfortable. I had a very upbeat attitude. The only thing that was the hardest on me was that I was picked on a lot because I didn't have any real decent clothes and my teeth went bad very young. And uh, when, when I had to have my forefront teeth extracted uh, in 1959, 58, uh, it was very, very difficult from that point, going to graduating grammar school like that, going to the first year of high school, which was a nightmare, 
and then beginning the second year, which was even worse. Uh, and then ultimately, because the family was doing so poorly, I had to, I had, I was the oldest son. I had to try, I had to go out and try to make some money. And so I dropped out of school and after the ninth grade and um, it was, it was difficult. It was very difficult. The childhood, my, my mother, rest her soul, was a very troubled woman. And uh, I didn't realize until I started researching this book and talking to relatives that I really wasn't close to, and then finding online that my mother, actually my cousin who passed away in her memoirs, uh, brought to the surface that my mother was an inmate at 16 years old in the Trenton, New Jersey detention center. My grandmother turned her over to the state. So that was a shock to me. And it kind of, in, in another way, it kind of put things in perspective because my mother, uh, after talking to my Aunt Doris, my mother's youngest sister, who I really didn't know that well, but I met, met her fortunately before she passed away recently, and she did tell me that my mother and my mother's closest sister, Viola, were severely sexually abused in that home. And that's a heartbreaker. But knowing that, it kind of put it, it, it put it in perspective, really. Mm -hmm. So you had dropped out of high school to help support your family. Tell mm -hmm. us about the circumstances surrounding you being drafted. Well, I after after a couple of years, uh, my aunt Laura, I got to give her kudos here. Uh, she passed away, but she was my saving grace. Uh, after a year out of out of school, uh, I was working, doing anything people would hire me for, scrubbing floors, cleaning attics. I knocked on every business for miles. No one would hire me because of my appearance. I did, I, I looked like I was twelve years old. I didn't have any front teeth. <laughs> oh my goodness. So uh, uh, at the end of the day, my, my aunt took me to Newark, had my teeth fixed, which was a wonderful saving grace. Mm -hmm. And uh, I came back to uh, the shore and I got a job on the boardwalk at Howard Johnson's as a dishwasher. And it was a simple job as a dishwasher and a, and a busboy. But, but I felt like I hit the lottery. Somebody accepted me. And I worked extremely hard and uh, all the rock concerts and the entertainment was next door. So the performers came in and I got friendly with them. And I said, you know, that's what I want to do. So uh, from there, I, I got a job at the Empress Motel, which was the Rat Pack days of 1963. And I was working 14 hours a day with one day off all month. Uh, and uh doing busing in the morning, room service for lunch, bus, busing and dinner, and then doing room service until 11 or 12 at night. And on Saturday nights in the summer, uh, in the spring actually of 63, going into the summer, the band used to love to get me up on stage in the lounge to sing every time it rains, it rains, and, <laughs> and tell some jokes because I used to have to bring room service to the bridal suites. And uh, there were always a lot of jokes about that, with me dropping the oysters and having to go downstairs and, and get another order and stupid jokes like that. And um, as luck would have it, one night there was a rock and roll show in town. Uh, Gene Pitney, Clyde McFadder, Paul and Paulo had a big record at that time. And the host was Clay Cole. He had a, uh, he was like the Dick Clark of New York. I, I knew who he was because I used to watch his dance show. And I did my shtick and the waitress came up. One of the waitresses said, Billy, that table would like to see you. I went over and I recognized Clay right away and Gene Pitney, who I idolized. And they said, sit down here. You're a very talented young man. How would you like to come to New York? I think there's a manager I know that would really be into what you're doing. And I explained that I only had one day off a month. And they said, doesn't matter. Give us some heads up when you want. I went up and on July 16th of 1963, I signed my first management contract and I've been working independently in the, in the business ever since. Mm -hmm. And then in 1965, the management thing didn't work out because I, I had the look, but I didn't have my own songs. So I started songwriting 
And in 1965, the spring of 65, I got signed by Kama Sutra Productions. And they were producing Jay and the Americans, the Shangri-Las, uh, and uh, other uh, Dupree's and some other good acts. And they recorded me. And I, I was on cloud nine. My first song was recorded by the Dupree's. And uh, they had just signed the Love and Spoonful. And they had a group called the Hassles. Billy Joel was the piano player. And they had Billy Terrell. And they went to MGM Records and said, we need distribution. We want to do our own label because we have the next three forces in the music business. We have this kid, Billy Terrell, who's the next Phil Spector. <laughs> and I can't tell you how happy I am. They were wrong about that. But <laughs> so uh, I, I had the record, uh, you know, and I, I saw the Dupree's on TV. It was a wonderful time. And I was ready to release a record. And the uh, Vietnam War had escalated a few months prior to that with the Gulf of Tonkin incident. Uh, There's enough to be said about that madness. Uh, and the draft came along and I was drafted. I was supposed to uh, report in July, but my dear grandfather, who I love so much, passed away. And I was so devastated. I, I, I called the Selective Service and they uh, gave me a month to get myself together. And I ultimately uh, reported for the draft on August 5th, 1965. And you had a tough childhood and you hustled and you were making things happen for yourself, right? And then the draft notice comes. Did you ever consider trying to evade your draft notice in any way as so many did? Never, never entered my mind. Uh, me, well, first of all, I, I, there was no way I would do it. And I had so much respect for, for my family that came from Italy and my mother's side coming from Germany and Scotland uh, that uh, I, I felt, I, I, I instinctively felt blessed being an American. And if, my, if this country wasn't open to my grandfather and my other grandfather, uh, I wouldn't have the privilege of being raised an American and with these opportunities. I didn't look at my life as all that negativity. I said, that's what it was, but now we've got to find a way. Mm -hmm. And I know it was a big interruption, but I stood up the company the night before I, <laughs> The night before I reported for the draft, I went back to New York to say goodbye to people because obviously not knowing if I'd ever see anybody again, hoping I would. And the record label, they, they, were, they kept preaching. They had a seance. One of the rooms that we used to write, they had a black light. All the lights were out and it was a black light. Well, you saw always your white shirt and your eyes. They had a beatnik priest from the village banging on this gong and talking in tongues. I never heard of such a thing. And he's blah, 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 boom, boom, boom. And I don't know if you ever heard of a, of a, of a guy named Mani Rock III, who was a Hispanic flamboyant hairdresser in New York. He was the hairdresser to the stars. He was on Johnny Carson all the time and he was dabbling in music. They had Monty Rock III come to the office. Monty Rock had a ribbon in his hair and he had a ponytail all the way almost to the floor. And they said, Billy, sit down and cross your legs. And I figured, okay, well, whatever. And I'm, I'm sitting on the floor like this. Monty Rock III stands over me and pulls the ribbon out and his hair engulfed me sitting on the floor. I was sitting there in Monty Rock's hair tent. I didn't know what to make of it. Finally, I moved, <laughs> stuck my head out, and I said, now what? The president of the company handed me, he held up a pair of ladies' panties and a dead fish. And he said, Billy, you're going to ruin your career by going in the army. You've got to wear these bloomers. you got to put the dead fish in it. And when you show up at the draft, with a dead fish and ladies' underwear, there's no way they're gonna send you to Vietnam. I stood up and I turned on the lights. And I said, look guys, I appreciate what you're, 
what you know, I appreciate your belief in me and everything, but my grandfather came here with nothing. And he worked very hard. And he met my grandmother, who was the rock of Gibraltar. He learned English. He built a nice business. Of course, the Depression in 29, 30s, you know, hurt him badly. But that gave me the opportunity to be born in America. And there's no way that I'm going to turn my back on this country. And the bottom line is I'm going to serve. I'll go to war. And if I make it back, great. And if I don't, I can accept that. And I walked out. In your memoir, The Other Side of Rock and War, which I can't recommend enough, you say that you felt like the, quote, dregs of society were being drafted. Tell me a little more about that. Well, that's the way I felt when we were drafted. And the last several years, uh, reading articles, and of course, I'm a member of VFW and American Legion and Vietnam Veterans of America. I get the magazines, I see the articles, I see the history, I've read other books, and uh, uh, we were the dregs. In 1965, uh, President Johnson told uh, the Secretary of Defense McNamara, we're going to draft, stay away as much as you can stay away from the middle class kids because those are the parents that vote. So they were targeting, unfortunately, what was referred to as McNamara's 100,000 morons. I was in that 100,000. And they were drafting poor kids, whites, poor blacks, poor Hispanics. A real tragedy is they went into the, uh, they went into the, uh, I'm trying to think of the term. The um, people in the and uh, in the, tra in the the mountain people, mm -hmm. and they drafted a lot of the uh, um, mountain people from the Appalachian, the Appalachians, and that was a real tragedy because they really weren't qualified to learn fast enough, and they were sending them to Vietnam fast enough, and many of them really died needlessly because they didn't belong there. You know, they should have been put in other positions because they just couldn't grasp it. And that's a heartbreaker. But we were the dra the, the first 100,000 and be before the draft, before the lottery went in. Uh, you could, I had people in the neighborhood whose son, who uh, a guy in the neighborhood forced his son to marry a girl that he didn't even like. Mm -hmm. Because if you got married, you were deferred. If you went to, if you had a, if you were able to go to college, even if it's for an art degree, or you were studying the uh, personal lives of cockroaches and worms, I cleaned that up. And uh, <laughs> uh, as long as you were in college, you were deferred. And that. That was disturbing for me when I got on the bus in Asbury Park and took that horrendously hot ride on the bus to Newark, New Jersey to the induction center, because I looked around and I related to everybody on that bus as being raised poor. And, uh, but there's a very interesting sidebar to this observation. Many of us, not all of us, but many of us, wanted to go because it was a feeling of being accepted. Now we're in the service. Now we're somebody. I know that's how I felt. I felt I'm somebody now. And a lot of guys that I went with that I spoke to about it. Uh, and I, you know, spoke to guys that I found years later and brought up the subject and they said, you're right, Bill. Uh, you know, we were kicked around as kids. We had a poor upbringing. And we were shunned as being poor. We were mistreated. And uh, But all of a sudden, war or no war, we're in a uniform and our lives are worth something. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Tell me about 
your memories of basic and, and your adjustment to military life? Uh, it was pretty interesting in the beginning. Uh, there were certain fellows that showed up at Fort Dix and we had a little bit of a waiting period before we got assigned to a basic training uh, company. And I'll never forget, so we had to pick up cigarette butts and mow the grass. And, and I'll never forget one day, they had these old lawnmowers uh, where, the, where the top was open. And you look down there, you see the blades spinning around. And we had a guy, I remember his name was Poole. I forget where he was from. But from the day we got there, he's saying, I, I'm not doing this, I want out. He actually went up to a sergeant and said, I'll take a dishonorable discharge. <laughs> and the sergeant said, you can't request a dishonorable discharge. So every day we're cutting grass together and he keep me. So one day I said, Poole, for heaven's sake, we're drafted. We got to do it. Might as well make the best of it. Mm -hmm. And he says, well, I figured a way out. And I said, well, now what? And he took his finger like this. And he said, how are they going to send me to Vietnam with no trigger finger? And he stuck his finger down and chopped it off on the lawnmower. Blood everywhere. Hmm. Never saw him again. <laughs> Talk about extreme. And that was a pretty horrifying moment, really. But basic training, here's the plus about basic. They treated us pretty rough, but that was part of the, part of the program. And I understand that now because... Uh, a lot of the drill sergeants were Korean War veterans. They were lifers and they had served in Korea. And as I look back on it now, as much as I know about post-traumatic stress disorder, because I've been treating it now for 11 or 12 years, finally got into a good group with a good psychologist and uh, make him come into terms. But I realize now that a lot of those guys had severe PTSD. Mm -hmm. And that's why they were so over the top arrogant. It was more than training. They were smacking people, kicking people. And, and, uh, but overall, basic training for me and this group of underprivileged people, looking back, we had three meals a day. We had plenty of exercise. Mm -hmm. We had camaraderie. We were all in a barracks. And we were gaining weight. We were looking better, and uh, it, it, it was it was a positive experience. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's so interesting. So now, tell us about when and how you found out you'd actually be going to Vietnam. Well, I did uh, sixteen weeks of uh, between basic and uh, advanced infantry training in Fort Dix did 16 weeks. And then uh, myself and a couple of other guys were uh, sent to Fort Lee, Virginia for a quartermaster school. And I think that was a four or five week course. And uh, while we were there, uh, we were told that we were, that they, they read off at the end of the bit, they read off who was going where. And I was in the group that was going to go to Vietnam. And we were told that we got to keep our mouth shut. We can't talk about anything. We're going to ship out. You guys are going to ship out in a couple of days. Uh, so I found out then. And uh, so the, the night before we were about to ship out, uh, a sergeant and two MPs came in the barracks. And they pulled, I think, five of us out, myself, Bobby Reed, and two or three other, other guys. I know Bobby Reed and I went all the way through Vietnam. Well, Army, right from Dix, right through when we came home to go. So uh, they woke us up and said, come on, we're shipping out. And I said, we're shipping out in the morning. It's, it's only 2 o'clock. Get your stuff. We're shipping out. OK. So they put us on a train and they wouldn't tell us where we were going. And I forget if it was two days or whatever we were on the train. We ultimately wound up in Kansas at Fort Riley and we joined the 96th Quartermaster and we trained, uh, that was February, March, April. 
think we got there at the end of mid-February. And we trained uh, in the hills with the 1st Infantry Division because we had to learn all the tactics. Even though we were supply, we had to learn what to do because the supply lines were always a target. We were always a target, getting supplies to the troops, doing this, doing that. So we had to have, we, we had to be prepared for anything. And we trained with the 1st Infantry Division. Uh, and then uh, the second round, we found out in May, uh, you can't say a word, but we're shipping out. We're going to Oakland, California. We're getting on a troop ship and we're going to Vietnam. And uh, the night before we shipped out, because <laughs> I used to go down, a lot of the guys in Kansas would go to Junction City because that's where a lot of the prostitutes and a lot of the not so good stuff went on. Me, I had my guitar and I went to Kansas State University. They had a marvelous little village called Aggieville. And I used to go in the coffee houses on weekend and play with the peanuts on the floor. And then right outside the camp in Ogden, they had a place called Delmonico's, which was a nightclub that had a band about five nights a week. And I used to go over there and sit in with the band. So the night before we shipped out, we weren't supposed to leave. We were quarantined to the post. We weren't allowed to leave. And I was very disciplined. I, you know, I was, I was a good guy, never broke any rules. But I said to myself, I got to play one more time. Mm -hmm. So I creeped off the base and I hitchhiked over to Delmonico's and I'm up there playing and enjoying myself. And a sergeant came in and sat down who also <laughs> wasn't supposed to be off the base. <laughs> So, <laughs> so after I played some songs, he came over to me and he tapped me on the shoulder. He says, you're not supposed to be here. I says, well, Sergeant, the way I see it, what are you going to do? Send me to Vietnam? I'm already on my way. He said, well, if you don't talk, I won't talk. I says, I won't talk. Let's have a, at that point, I wasn't drinking. I says, I'll have a soda, you have another beer, and we'll work our way back. And that was that. <laughs> It sounds like you didn't get leave to go home and say goodbye to your family or anyone before you left. Oh no, absolutely did. Oh, uh, did. And, okay, uh, oh yeah, oh yeah. A week before uh, I got home, they got me a a plane ticket. As a matter of fact, that was the first time I was on an airplane. Uh, I took a small plane from Fort Riley to uh, Kansas City. Uh, no, actually, actually, yes. Took a small plane to Kansas City took an airliner to Chicago, and then I got on a United flight to Newark from Chicago. So the first day I ever flew, I flew three times. And uh, yeah, I was home about a week. And uh, uh, I went to New York to say goodbye. An interesting story here. My friend Ralph Mara got drafted with me, uh, but he got orders for Okinawa, lucky him. And I got the non. So I had to go to New York to say goodbye to uh, people that I'd worked with, George, George uh, Shadow Morton, who produced uh, the Shangri-Las, and I sang background on some of those records and, and a lot of people. So, and I said, Ralph, why don't you come with me? And uh, so I went to see uh, George and some other people, and he said, hang out a bit, because I have a young girl coming in to audition. He was a great producer. And this young lady walks in with her manager with bare feet, with a guitar, sits on the floor with her legs crossed and plays the most incredible music. Uh, and, and so Shadow said, Billy, what do you think? I says, well, I think she's either going to the top or she's going to fall on her face because this is the most unique music I'd ever heard. And it was Janicean. <laughs> So we left there and Ralph wanted to go to the Metropole. Now uh, the Metropole was a jazz club on 7th Avenue and during and an evening and during the day they had the women couch dancers. They weren't like today. I mean, they were, you know, they, they had these pasties, you know, and uh, they were partially, you know, and they did the couch dances up on the stage. I really wasn't into it, but I said, Ralph, if you want to go, 
I'll have a soda or something, forget it. So we're in there and I'm in my uniform because I went back to New York in my uniform. And this woman's doing her routine. And after her set, she comes down and says, hi, fellas. And uh, how are you soldiers? Yeah. And I told her I was shipping out to Vietnam. And tears came down her face. And she called the waiter over and she said, give these guys anything they want on me. And before we left, she gave me a big hug. So I'm back from Vietnam. And this is late, either late 68 or early 69. I'm watching the Johnny Carson show. And he has a guest on there that starts singing, Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy from Company B. And I'm looking, I'm saying, oh my goodness, that's the girl of the Metropole. It was Bette Midler. <laughs> it was Bette Midler. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> I, I freaked out. I said, my God, that's the girl that hugged me at the Metropole. <laughs> it was Ben Midler. Oh, my goodness. What a life. What a life. So back to Kansas, then to California, yeah. then on the troop ship. Yes. Okay. Tell us what you remember about the troop ship. A lot. I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you the, the highlights. Uh, first of all, we went from Oakland to Tacoma, Washington, and we picked up another battalion. There were about 4,000 of us on this on this troop ship, the Walker, uh, which was a destroyer in World War II. And it was now a troop ship. And uh, in the early days of the war, it would go uh, from Oakland to uh, Queenon, Cameron, Vung Tau, and then back more troops until all the companies were there. And then the rest of the forces would, rest of the guys would come in individually as replacements on a plane. So the ship, the food was terrible. I mean, awful. And the milk was always sour. The, they had powdered eggs for breakfast. And there were so many people that after you had this little nothing breakfast, you had to go to the end of the line because by the time you got through, it was lunchtime. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty rough. Uh, and uh, so... I was the guy that always had the schemes. So I got a hold of my buddy. This is hilarious. I got a hold of Reed and I said, Reed, I got an idea. And I was a male guy too. I was in, in, and with other duties, I was like the male guy. And you had to do other duties because there were never enough mail to no, might as well not keep me in Vietnam. So I said, look, Reed, I got two big mail bags. You take this one and go in the dining room and stand by the dumbwaiter. I'm going to take this one and I'm going to get down. And at that time, we we're halfway around, across the ocean and they had an armed guard at the, at the kitchen downstairs where the food was stored because everybody was dying for something good to eat. And we just weren't getting it. But we knew the officers were doing well on the other upper deck. So I said, you stand by the dumbwaiter. I'm going to go down. I'm going to put food on there and send it up to you. Put it in a bag and take it down, down, down to our cabin. He says, are you nuts? I said, no, I'll show you. <laughs> I went down and I told the armed guard, uh, I'm collecting mail. He says, oh, man, go downstairs. And I'm going to I went down. I said <laughs> to the cooks, I said, um, anybody got any mail to go? They're all writing letters. And I went over by the food and I started packing food on the on the dumbwaiter and rolling it up to read. And everybody gave me their letters in the bag and they're hugging me. Oh, this is great. And I left. And I said to myself, what did they think I was going to do with these letters in the middle of the Pacific Ocean? But it worked. We went back down to our uh, cabin and we were like in these hammocks. You know, for it and all of our buddies were sitting there were having a feast in the middle of the night <laughs> so uh, it was it was an interesting trip across and uh we stopped at guam uh i i don't know if we refueled or not and then we finally arrived at queen on 
and we let off uh, one of the uh, companies in Queen Anne, and then we got off in Cameron Bay. Uh, and that's where we were. We stayed in Cameron, which was a very safe area at the time. We didn't know it at first, but we were frightened. But, uh, but it turned out to be pretty safe. And we hung around for a few days and then they, then we convoyed down to uh, Phan Rang and we got our first taste of the real Vietnam. Hmm. What were your first impressions of Vietnam? Well, I, I was only in eight days and I, I was very friendly with the officers because I played the music in Fort Riley and I was, I was, I had something, they liked me, I, I could talk, they could talk to me. And um, I went to Captain Bond, who I, I'm in touch with, I've been in touch with for quite some time, wonderful guy. And I got Captain Bond on the side when we got to Phan Rang, because we, we had an interesting convoy down there, uh, trip. And I said, Captain Bond, I said, you know what? I got a feeling the best we can do is just get through this year, do the best we can, because I don't think we're gonna be able to deal. I don't think we're gonna be able to prevail on the ground. Uh, these people are too dedicated. And we didn't know about the tunnels at the time. I said to Captain Bond, I said, did you see anybody? I didn't see anybody. So either they're invisible or they have a, a, a strange way of dealing with this. And I, my, my first impression was I was very dedicated to do the best I could, but I, uh, I instinctively knew early that strategically it was going to be a nightmare. Mm. What was your job in the military described for the lay person? Like you talked about your male responsibilities, but once you're on the ground in Vietnam, what are your duties? Well, I had, I had everybody, this is the interesting part that, that everyone had to do perimeter guard and everyone wound up on a certain number of convoys, whether you were riding shotgun or whether you were driving. So, on the, uh, quite frankly, on the base camp, because Tuiwa was down toward the, the sea, down toward the beach, uh, and we had a pretty wide perimeter before, and then we had the Korean Rock Division with us, so whoever, they were really great, great protectors. But uh, in addition to the mail, which there wasn't very much of, I would go up and get supplies up in Northfield and bring back mail and bring back supplies. I would bring people that are sick up to 563rd Medivac where I was Medivac from when I went, I went and, uh, and all messed up. And uh, so uh, I, I did that. And in the base camp, it was relatively, once we got settled and the Koreans came in, we were relatively safe in base camp. But the perimeter guards at night, perimeter guard at night was a challenge uh convoys were a challenge uh and you had a lot of uh a lot of people uh in these hamlets at uh in the patties that they they were waving to you during the day but they were your enemy at night so you never you couldn't drop your guard you were didn't matter in vietnam it was all about location 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 your your military occupation occupational specialty uh had not, it had nothing to do with it, whether you were safe, not safe, whether you got into problems, whether you got shot, whether you came face to face with the enemy. The uh, occupational specialty had nothing to do with it. It was all location, location, location. I often said that if our company landed in 1966 and we set up the supply stuff in Saigon, at that time, before the Tet Offensive, I was already home before that. I said that at that time, most of us would have had apartments downtown. The end of the day, we'd have been downtown at the bars. And then on weekends, we'd be over in Vung Tau surfing, mm. which took place. But, you know, we were sent to Phan Rang, and then we camped in 
Tuiwa, and then we did operations in these really crazy places, Doc Fo, very dangerous places. So, uh, you know, that was, uh, your, your, I, I did a lot of different things, you know, I went on the convoys, fly convoys. Uh, I did uh, handle whatever mail we got. I built them, I took a Connex container and built a mail room in it where I kept the mail and I took coffee cans and did it alphabetically. That was kind of fun. And, um, and I got along so well with everybody because they always looked up to the mail guy, you know? <laughs> Any mail, any mail, you know, so, and then I, uh, I was a supply guy, you know, doing, doing whatever it took to uh, accomplish the mission and, uh, and survive. Speaking of the mail, veterans often talk about how important mail was to them. And at one point you decided that your unit wasn't getting enough mail and you were going to do something about that, right? Absolutely. Tell us a little about that. Well, we weren't, uh, when, it, when it got to, uh, we got to Tuiwa, uh, I think in August. We were in Phan Rang in July, I think probably a month. And then we moved to Tuiwa and uh, we weren't, excuse me, we weren't uh, getting a lot of guys just weren't getting mail. Quite frankly, I only got three letters the whole year. But I got one from my mother. And then when I was in the hospital in Nha Trang, my father sent me a very short one, and my Aunt Laura sent me one, but that was it. I don't, it was just the way it was. I wasn't married. I didn't have a girlfriend, so I didn't have the... So anyway, a, a lot of us just weren't getting any mail, and the other guys, a lot of guys. And I, I came up with a brainstorm. I wrote to Monmouth University, explained who I was, that I was from the shore. At that time, I was, my family was living in West Steel. We moved out of Bradley Beach. And I said, I'm in Vietnam uh, and I'm in charge of the mail here and we're not getting enough mail. And I would love it if you would have your students write letters to and address it to any soldier care of the 226 Supply and Service. And I gave the APO, not knowing what would happen. Well, for about a, about a month later, maybe a little less, and for months after, I got bundles of letters from Monmouth County, Monmouth uh, College students. Mm -hmm. And I made sure that everybody in that, and not only my company, because then the base camp grew with 606 ordnance, 5th to 27th artillery, we had a transportation company, uh, so the camp, and I made sure that everybody in that camp got a letter at least once a month. Mm -hmm. And thanks to Monmouth University. <laughs> and the letter, Monmouth University has that letter in their archives. You can find it in there. I may be biased, but I love that story, Billy. <laughs> <laughs> I can understand that. Now, you referenced the civilian population and said it could be difficult to tell who was friend or foe, but there was one segment of the population that you became especially close with, and that's the orphans. Yes. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, of course. Uh, the, well, to prefix it, in the, in the early, in the early uh, days at Tuiwa, we were just establishing the base. It was, it, was, it was dangerous because they brought a lot of civ civilians to help out. And I protested several times. I said, you know, we really don't know. You know, I hate to say they all look alike because that's, you know, that's a bad word today. And I, I don't feel that way anyway. Uh, but it was, let's just say it was hard to distinguish. It was hard to figure out who you could trust. And, it, and uh, so, and we had, uh, you know, people that we were being infiltrated. There were, there were, uh, uh, booby traps, they're called IEDs today, improvised devices. We call them booby traps. And they would put these booby traps in the uh, forklifts. Yeah. And if you're in a forklift in the morning, to lift it up, boom. And uh, people were getting killed, people were getting hurt. So it was difficult to deal with. And then one day in September of 66, uh, the Manglang Orphanage in Tuyan, up in Fuyan province, about 45 clicks north 
was overrun by North Vietnamese regulars on Viet Cong. And we were supporting the 101st Airborne. And the 101st Airborne led the way along with some help, extra supplies, and uh, fought off the uh, Vietnamese, the, uh, the, the, the enemy. Uh, one uh, person working at the orphanage was killed. Uh, and what we did is we helped evacuate 110 of the, of the orphans and the Catholic nuns down to the Tuiwa area. And they were put into a, a small hospital down there, very dirty in the back end of the hospital. And the beds were so close, you couldn't walk between the bunks and the babies were actually piled on each other. It was almost like looking in the chicken coop, you know, the chickens, the way they're all. So before we went down there, one day, Sister Michelle and Sister Teresa, two nuns show up at our base camp and they were rummaging for food. Now we were eating World War II sea rations, leftover food from World War II. We did have some B rations because we had a mess tent, but we were eating World War II food. And any of those cans that were dropped in or brought in on pallets or drugs, sometimes they have to drop them. Any cans that looked damaged in any way, they had to be burned because they were contaminated. So Sister Michelle and Sister Teresa came by with a pillowcase or a sack, and they're taking those cans out of our fire pit. And God rest his soul, Lieutenant Shear went over to them, and he somehow got the message across that that food is no good. It's not good. So he took it from them, and he gave them $10 in military script to buy food. And about an hour later, they came back to our base camp with a Catholic priest who spoke enough English to let Lieutenant Shear know about these circumstances. Lieutenant Shear asked me to come down. We went to the hospital. We saw the babies. We saw the way they were living. So we put cigar boxes out. Uh, for donations for all the troops in the area. And Lieutenant Shear wrote to his parish in Chicago, and uh, they took up a collection, sent over $600. He was able to convert it into at a very high rate in mm -hmm. Vietnamese piastres. And uh, we had enough money to buy a strip of land and the coll collections from those troops, plus the people pitching in, we were able to build a new orphanage. And uh, it's still there today. It's a government-run daycare center. And it was a marvelous experience. And as much as we could, we went down and we fed the children. And uh, I had to drive through Tuiwa quite a few times a week. So I would always go to the orphanage. And uh, once I taught the boys to play baseball, that's all they want. When I came, they ran, they got the bat and the makeshift ball. And, and it was a marvelous experience to care for these children and they were so appreciative and, and uh, it was it was an incredible experience it's a beautiful story in the midst of such tragedy um earlier you referenced the time you were medevaced now you have to tell us more about that well i wasn't feeling well for quite some time it was the monsoon season and I was wet a lot of times. And then of course on perimeter guard at night, heavy, heavy rain blowing sideways. You got a poncho on, you're really worried because visibility is bad. You don't know if you're gonna get shot. You don't know if they're gonna come up behind you and you're soaking wet. And I, I was just bummed out because we had had some really bad experiences. We had graves registration on uh, the post, on, on our camp where they brought in uh, the dead and they had to be processed and then sent to Saigon to be sent home. And uh, those are horrendous, sorry, horrendous memories. So uh, 
between that stress of that and the stress of not feeling well, uh, ultimately one day, a few days after my 22nd birthday in November of 66, I was, I just was out of it. So I was on a convoy and actually the, the Koreans, a couple of Koreans broke from the convoy, took me to North Field, Tuiwa, to 563rd Medivac, which was a tent on a hill where a lot of casualties were dropped off and the Hueys and helicopters would come in, the choppers would come in and take us to hospitals. And um, there were heavy casualties, it was a heavy casualty day. So the guys that needed intense treatment were in the tent and it was raining hard, but a handful of us had to be wrapped up in ponchos and left outside the tent in the rain. And it was, the weather was too bad to get the choppers in. So we were laid in the water overnight. So finally, the next day, myself and a couple of other guys, we were medevac to Queen Anne, uh, where uh, 8th Field uh, 67th Evacuation Hospital was on the uh, air base. And I was there, uh, I forget if it was three days, four days, and they decided to send me down to Natrang to 8th Field because they had a lot more doctors down there. And uh, in the interim, I had contacted double pneumonia on top of malaria. Mm. So when I got to 8th Field, I was in such bad shape. And uh, the doctors, came, they brought me in and put me, they didn't have a spot for me at 8th Field. It was filled... The ICU was crowded. So they put me in a bunk right inside the door because uh, they had to treat the shooting victims and the, mm -hmm. what a mess. And uh, so when the doctor finally got to me, he says, oh my God, he said, ice him. His temperature, he's gonna, this guy's gonna die. Yeah. Get that temperature down, the only way to do it. So they had an, a, a big tub of ice and water. And they actually had to dunk me in ice water mm. to keep it from going to 106. It was already 105 and going. And mm. they got me out, they dressed me up, uh, put me in ICU. And uh, it was a horrific, uh, horrific experience. So I, uh, I, I didn't think I was going to make it. And uh, the doctor said to the, once they uh, got me, the IVs and everything. The, the a doctor came to the medic and said, I want you to check this fella's uh, vitals every 30 minutes. And I want you to give him a shot. And if you have to ice him again, don't worry about it, do it. And I, I heard him say, if he's still with us in the morning, we'll have a chance to save him. Mm. And uh, that was one of the most difficult nights that I've ever had because I struggled to stay awake. Mm. And, and I must have said, a, who knows, I say a hundred times, probably was 20 times. It was during the holidays between Christmas, between Thanksgiving and Christmas and the Red Cross came in and put a string of Christmas lights and I'm looking at the lights and I kept saying over and over, what's my mother gonna do? What's my mother gonna do if I, if I don't make it? It'll kill her. I never felt more helpless in my whole life. I could just, Imagine my mother getting that message. It, it, as you can see, still today, it's it's a horrendous, horrendous piece of memory, and it never lightens up. I can, it's fifty eight years, and it's fifty six years from uh, sixty five years, fifty five years. <laughs> Obviously can't add. I do a joke where after high school, I went to discotheque, but uh, 
nevertheless, folks, uh, so uh, I remember the next, I passed out, I obviously passed out. And I remember the next morning, I saw this bright light, nothing else but this bright light. And the first thing that came to mind is, I'm out of here. That's the light that you hear about. And I went, oh my goodness. And I was like stunned. And then about five minutes later, we had the sandbags and the tents. And there was a gap, about a three foot gap between the sandbag and where the tent came. And about three, four, five minutes later, I noticed the sun coming up over the sandbags. Mm -hmm. And it was the sun. And then I knew that I had made it. <laughs> it, was, it was nuts. So anyway, to get through this segment, uh, segue, uh, Martha Ray, the comedian who was a great comedian and performer in the 40s and 50s and a, a great, uh, she was a uh, commissioned, she was a, an army nurse. She had a, uh, uh, she was a colonel. Yeah. Uh, and we used to call her Colonel Maggie. Colonel Maggie was the greatest. So I had gone down to, it was obvious I was going to recover to some degree. I had gone down to uh, 89 pounds and I couldn't lift it. I was laying on the bed and there was a spoon on my table and I, I didn't have the strength to get that spoon completely up off the table. Mm. And the doctor came around and he said, look, Troop, you got to get out of this bed and you got to walk yeah. or you're going to die. There's no other way to put it. You're, you you got to get that blood going, that circulation, and you got to start building strength. You're not going to make it. And I said, I'm too weak. And the next morning, Colonel Maggie came in. And she rubbed my head. And she said to me, Troop, the word is, if you don't walk, you're going to die. And you know what? And she used some choice words. You're not going to die on my watch. Now, just relax. She went around and she grabbed me from behind with a bear hug. And lift, I, was, I didn't know Gumby at the time. Mm -hmm. But now that I know who Gumby is, I was like Gumby. <laughs> I was just flapping in the wind. She made me stand on her feet and she held me up and she walked me to and from. And she came in the next morning. Come on, troop. You're going for your walk. Pick me up. Walk me three days in a row. And on the uh, late in the third day, the doctor came, stopped by my bed and he said, uh, whether you know it or not, Colonel Maggie saved your life. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 1987, I was writing songs with uh, Richie Adams, who wrote Tossin' and Turnin'. Good writer. We had, I enjoyed writing with Richie. And a woman called Gloria Nissenson, who I did not know was an off-Broadway producer. So she had to cancel one of the writing sessions. She said that her show was closing. And I said, what show? She had a show, I forget the name of the show, but Martha Ray was in the show. <laughs> I says, oh my God, I gotta, I gotta see her. She said, she's leaving. So I said, well, let me write a note. So I wrote a note to Martha Ray, what had happened. I wrote it quickly, but I said, I'm here today. God bless you. So two weeks later, when Gloria came back to write with us, I said, were you able to give uh, Colonel Maggie my note? She says, oh, my God. She said, Billy, she handed it to her manager and said, hang on to this. I have to read this in private. Aww. And after the show, she went up to the green room, read the note, turned out the lights, and drank most of a bottle of scotch. Aww. And she, was, she had to leave that night. And they had to help her to get on the plane and back to L.A. It was quite remarkable. <laughs> so you fight and the medical personnel don't give up on you and you turn the corner. Now, if I'm recalling properly from your memoir, 
we're almost out of time, but you get sent back into the field, right? Well, that was interesting, yeah, because I thought, I thought in the condition I was in, I thought for sure that they were going to send me home. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't begging for it. I wasn't, I wasn't calling for it, but I, I figured, you know, I, what am I going to do in this condition? Mm -hmm. And I asked the doctor, I said, what are you guys going to do with me? You're going to send me to Philippines or you're going to send me offshore and then on home. No, no, we can't do that because you weren't in one facility for more than 30 days. Hmm. I said, but wait a minute. I was in 560-30 VAC. I was in Queenon. I'm in here. I forget how long I was there. It must have been at least three weeks, maybe four weeks, maybe close to four weeks. But because I was, it couldn't have been because I wasn't 30 days. But because I wasn't in one facility for 30 days, they said, no, we got to send you back. So mm -hmm. I, I went back. I got back to my unit in January of 67. And I, uh, I was there until the end of May. Mm -hmm. And my M14 was 11.4 pounds. Mm -hmm. And I was under 100. Mm -hmm. So it was... Uh, was what it was. <laughs> so we're almost at the point where I have to break and take questions from the audience. Just to recap, you wind up serving 22 months. You are discharged and uh, you go on to have this really amazing career in the music industry and also in stand-up comedy. So for anyone who is interested in the rest, the post-Vietnam story, again, I encourage you to seek out Billy's memoir, uh, The Other Side of Rock and War. So let's let me stop asking questions for a minute and see if we have some from the audience. Is that okay, Billy? I love it. Awesome. Okay. So here is a question in the chat from JD who asks, what was it like to move so often? Uh, as a child. Yes. Uh, <laughs> well, I, 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 uh, I do, a, I do a line in my comedy act that uh, we were evicted 58 times. I used to have to call home after school for directions. Uh, and it gets a big laugh. <laughs> but it was it was difficult for a few reasons. Uh, one, uh, most of the time, many, many times, we didn't have utilities. And uh, the, the biggest tragedy about moving that much was that each time we moved, it was like a midnight move. See, because back in the 50s, they didn't have the, the rules. Today, it's very difficult to make people leave the home. Uh, they've got these, uh, you know, laws, but that there was no, there were no laws. Uh, I remember 1955. It was, I think it was in, it had to be 1955. And uh, in the at 10:30 at night, my father woke me up mm -hmm. and said, "Come on, we're moving." And I raised up the sh the shade and I said, "Moving where? <laughs> we have to leave." The sheriff was at the door. Mm -hmm. The landlord was at the door. My father had to call a friend with a pickup truck and we put what we could in it. So the hardest part about moving so many times was that each time we moved through the 50s, we lost something else. We lost furniture. We lost clothes. You know, there were, most of the time we could, we, it was such a frantic situation that we we didn't have the capability of taking everything with us, so it got trashed. That, that was the hardest part. Do you feel that your upbringing made you in any way more adaptable or resilient or otherwise better equipped to adjust to military life? Oh, absolutely. Well, as I said before, the 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 the, the real the real connection, the, the real deciding factor was the military provided, it, it just provided encouragement. Mm. Uh, I was rejected terribly in school. I was bullied, uh, you know, and then, you know, kids 
are can be can be mean whenever. But when you're walking around with no four front teeth in high school, and I and uh, so my experience uh, in in high school was the worst of it was my school colors the first year were blue and gray. And I only had two pair of pairs of pants. I had black and green. And the other joke I do in the show occasionally is that on dress up day, I had either had to go to Ireland or North Vietnam. <laughs> so the, the <laughs> so those experiences, that rejection, uh, once I got to the army and got in uniform and I felt proud to serve. Mm. And my life was worth something. Mm. And now I wasn't that kid. My, my aunt, had, aunt Laura had fixed my teeth in the meantime. And I was back in New York and I was starting to make some progress. So, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the landing in the service and also being amongst a lot of the people who were very much like the people I grew up with that were poor, like me. Uh, it was almost like being in a, it was like we all graduated together. It's like we became citizens together. And that was, that was a, a very encouraging feeling. Mm. Here's a question from John. Billy, what do you feel was your biggest accomplishment in your fascinating life? Believe it or not, in the mid 80s, now mind you, I only have a ninth grade education, uh, but I educated myself. But the answer to John's question is of all the things I've done, I have to reflect back to 1985, uh, Temple University in Philadelphia has an RTF program, they have a jazz program. And some musician friends of mine that I used to hire to play on my records, they were teaching there. And they said, how would you like to lecture there? Because it's, it's boring and you have such an interesting history and we wanna establish a course called pop songwriting. So, I lectured four semesters at Temple University. And that is still today, one of the most gratifying things I've ever, I can ever imagine because the students, the Dean called me in after the first semester and said, sit down a minute. We don't know what it is you have, but everybody wants to get, we can't put any more people in that class, everybody. Mm -hmm. There are tons of people that heard about you that want to be in that class. And it was so, and for many years, I got, I got letters from students that wrote to the college or the temple, and they would send me the letters. And the most gratifying one, sorry for getting too long, but this is very interesting. Uh, I had a student, an Israeli student, who was really a pain in the butt. I knew he was doing drugs. He was always disrupting. He would go out, he was like freaking out all the time. I had to call security twice. I had to talk to the Dean. And uh, so about maybe six or seven years after I uh, did the four semesters and they're still teaching the course today after all these years, I get a let one of the letters was from Israel. And this young man said, he called me Professor Terrell. <laughs> okay. He said, I have to tell you, my parents spent a fortune <laughs> keeping me off the street from school to school. And of all of this, all that money and all those classes, I have to tell you, the only thing I ever learned that I could apply in my life is what you taught me. You taught me practical. Mm. And what you taught me is the only thing that I've been able to make work for myself. And that was pretty remarkable. So that alone, in my opinion, that's the most gratifying thing to, to share with the young people. Oh, I love that. 
Um, here's a question from Brian. Did you ever get to meet Martha again after Vietnam? You wrote her the letter, but did you ever get to meet her again? No, I didn't get to meet her again. Uh, I wish I had. Uh, but the Martha story, uh, what's really incredibly remarkable is that in, I was performing uh, in 19, I think it was 1991. I was in and out of Florida quite a bit uh, doing the comedy, you know, doing my stand-up act 200 nights a year for several years. And I, I visited my godmother in Newport Ritchie, Florida, because I was working, I think St. Peter, one of those towns. I was doing a rundown. And we were sitting having coffee and uh, she brought out the photo albums. And I was, and I liked doing that. And I was looking at family albums and there was a photo of my father in his uniform before he was discharged medically in uh, California with uh, some relatives that lived there. And my aunt goes on to say, which totally took me out. She said, all your father talked about when he came home from the army is the first night after being discharged, he stayed at Martha Ray's house in Bel Air. Mm -hmm. He was discharged with a comedian called Vic Earlson, who knew everybody in Hollywood. And they were in Camp Roberts. So they, the first night out, they went down to Hollywood at Slapsy Maxies and some of the clubs. And they hang out, they hung out with Martha Ray and so and Martha Ray, knowing they're out of their military guys, she insisted they stay with her in Bel Air the first night out. <laughs> Unbelievable. That's, that's really nuts. That's out there. <laughs> Here's a question from Michael. Thanks for being on Wreaths Across America Radio this morning. Did you get to listen to Armed Forces Radio in Vietnam as it was portrayed in the movie Good Morning Vietnam? No, actually, uh, we were up north. Uh, we didn't hear any music. We didn't hear any radio. I didn't hear anything. Uh, the whole time, I didn't hear any radio. The only uh, news I got once in a while, we would get Stars and Stripes, mm -hmm. uh, but that Stars and Stripes uh, would be uh, watered down, be censored, uh, whatever was going on, it would be from the uh, point of view of the military and the government. Uh, they, I knew it was all censored. But, but it was nice to get to get to read a couple of things. But no, we we didn't hear any music at all. The only music is whatever we played, or I had a little record player, you know, uh, hooked up to a generator, and uh, that was that was bizarre. But uh, no, we didn't hear any of that. This is a question from John. Can you tell us a funny story from your many comedy experiences? Oh, there's a lot of them. Uh, <laughs> Well, uh, one of one of the uh, one one of the, the craziest ones in the in the early days. See, I was forty one years old, you know, when I started comedy. Uh, I had merged my music business uh, with a with a company called Spotlight in New York, not knowing that they had all these comedians. They were booking music acts, and and uh, they wanted to start a publishing company. They hired me to do remixes. And I said, well, I'm looking for a presence back in New York. I have a good catalog. Why don't we do, a, you know, let's merge our businesses. You've got the office. I've got the goods. And uh, so one day, the uh, Bob Williams, the president, my partner, called me and he said, you know, you could do this comedy thing. It's taken off. And I didn't know the guys that were hanging in the office at that time. It was Jay Leno, it was Jerry Seinfeld, it was Paul Reiser, it was Yakov Smirnov, it was everybody, it was anybody. So I started doing the comedy. And anyway, to answer the question, the first uh, year, uh, actually the first year and a half, I was either audio taping or videotaping every performance, the open mics. And then when I started doing club dates, and I was working, I was booked for a weekend in Huntington Valley, Pennsylvania. And uh, the show was, I was opening, Drew, a young Drew Carey was middling for $100 a show. And Richard Jenny, who was brilliant, was the headliner. And Richard was on all the shows. Unfortunately, he committed suicide some years ago. But 
I decided, oh, I, I just don't feel like videotaping tonight. And what a dumb thing to do, because at the end, at, on the Saturday night at the last show, Richard Jenny said to Drew Carey and me, he said, hey, guys, let's go up and sing do up yeah. and hold the audience here. So we went up for 45 minutes, sing and do up, taking chin leads and the audience stayed and I could kick myself in the butt for not getting that videotape. It would have been fantastic. <laughs> so there were a million stories. There were some really crazy ones. Uh, you know, they weren't all, they weren't all great. I mean, I know, uh, you know, I took some gigs too early. Spotlight put me uh, out in St. Charles, Illinois, and I was only doing it for less than a year. And they put me opening for the uh, country guy, Jerry Reed. And I had 750 people in the audience and I choked and you could hear crickets. And it was, it was a very intimidating thing to not get any laughs with 750 people. Uh, that was pretty nuts. And, uh, and recently I sent a bunch of people uh, the story, uh, agents, friends of mine. And I said, remember that? Uh, well, I was, I was waiting for the cavalry charge because the, <laughs> they were staring at me. And I said, as, as, the, as the crowd let out, they put yellow tape around the stage. And uh, there were, for months, there was a chalk outline of my body. <laughs> <laughs> Here's another good question from JD. And it was in my back pocket also, because I can't wait for everyone to hear this story. Have you ever been back to Vietnam? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I, uh, in 2008, when I became computer savvy, and I started to get pretty good on the computer. Uh, one day, out of the blue, I went to Google and I put in Nine Lang Orphanage, not knowing what would come up. And up it came, a big story about a nonprofit out of Colorado called Airline Ambassadors. They had been going back to Vietnam a couple of times a year, visiting a lot of orphanages, bringing school supplies and money for food. And one of the places they went was Mang Lang, Mang Lang Orphanage. And I contacted them and I said, and I told them the story. And at that point, I finally, after decades, I had all my photos in a plastic bag. I didn't look at them for, I had no idea. I had no idea how poignant they were and how great they were of all the children and building the orphanage. I never looked at it. I couldn't, I, I, I couldn't do it uh, because for years I couldn't stand to hear babies cry. If I was at my mother's and my brother and sister had the kids there, I would go to the closet somewhere, close the door and put a pillow over my head. I, I, I couldn't stand to hear babies cry because it brought back all those memories. So uh, anyway, I moved on, did some research, contacted uh, Sister Modestine, who was in Oakland. And um, I hooked up uh, by chance with a woman called Tan, who had married a, an American in Saigon in 1972. And she lived in Poxitawney, Pennsylvania. She goes back to Vietnam about five, four or five times a year with Doctors Without Borders. She heard about me, contacted me and said, I wanna help you, you have to go back. So in 2013, actually on uh, Veterans Day, the 11th of November, um, my friend Lawrence Queso, video producer that I did a lot of music work with, uh, he was a uh, uh, top exec at CBS television for years, produced a lot of stuff. Uh, he went back to Vietnam with me. Tan put it all together with the visas, arranged everything in country. And we went back to Vietnam and uh, I visited our orphanage, which is a daycare center in Tui Hoa. And Tan had been there a few months prior to it. To it. And she let everybody over there know my story. And it was so heartwarming 
when I got to the daycare center and our, but of course our building was, they probably modified it a dozen times and they had five classrooms of children. They had a birthday, they had cake for me. They had the place decorated because it was my 69th birthday mm -hmm. that day. And the people were just wonderful. And all these children at the daycare, they were all in uniforms, same type of stuff. The skirts and the pants were the same. And the, they all had, and they were so wonderful. And it was so heartwarming because the principal of the daycare, the director, took me to each room individually. And in each one of these five rooms, the children formed a circle and sang happy birthday to me in English. That's up there with the temple story. <laughs> so we stayed in Tuiwa at the Sen Deluxe, which blew my mind. It was a five-star hotel right at the end of town right by the uh, causeway, the bridge I used to drive over and almost got killed a few times, especially at night. And there, this five-star hotel is there. Mm. And I stayed, we stayed there before we went up to Tuiyan. And I remember that night, uh, the first night I was up and I, my, Drapes were open, and from my hotel room, I could see the rice paddies, and I could see where I used to guard in the bunkers, because that rice paddies, they used to come across there to get into the camp, so we had to defend that strip. And, I re and the memories of that, and then all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, there was a horrific thunder and lightning storm with rain. I got out of bed to change the drapes, and a lightning bolt hit and the whole paddy lit up and it put me right back in the bunker and I was shaken like a leaf and I went down and I got on the computer and I uh, was able to connect with my a counselor at the vet center and she talked me down. The next day we went to Tuiyan to the original Mang Lang orphanage that was raided by the Viet Cong. And I reunited with Sister Michelle. And believe it or not, there were four of my babies still living with the nuns. <laughs> Three in wheelchair, two in wheelchairs, and, uh, and one was in the uh, mental ward. And uh, they had a birthday cake for me. They all knew the story. And Endow, who was crippled at birth, when we, we videotaped, we, we did, did, did it for a documentary, and which we haven't been able to get on yet. But anyway, through the Vietnamese interpreter, Laurie said to Endow, what are your memories of Billy in 1966? And this destroyed me. And Endow said, Billy always bought me special sweets. In the sea rations, we used to get toilet paper, cigarettes, food, and we'd get chocolate bars. And I didn't smoke, so I used to trade my cigarettes for the chocolates to share with the children, not only at the orphanage, but on the road. Mm -hmm. I used to stop on the road, and I was always told, you're going to get killed doing that one day. I said, I love those kids. They know me. So, <laughs> so anyway, Endow goes on to say, none of the other children would come around me because of my condition. She had deformed feet. She says, but she said, but every time Billy came, he held me and he taught me the hand game. And whenever Billy held me, I felt safe. And I never forgot him till this day. I always felt safe with Billy. And that Lawrence Casa said, he said, Billy, if you saw your face, you were like done. But, but of course, I mean, you know, experiences like that don't, don't, don't go away. So it was, it was a wonderful experience going back and uh, took photos and uh, 
the uh, little lady in the uh, mental ward, uh, she was so wonderful. She was just kissing my hand and hugging me. And they all knew me. I was blown away because you're talking 1966 to 2013. But I obviously made such a strong impression. And uh, it's a marvelous, marvelous opportunity. That's beautiful. So we are almost out of time. Let me ask you just one last question in sure. closing. What do you wish that more people knew about the experience of Vietnam War soldiers? Well, what I what I really what I really want them to know, and one of the main reasons I wrote the book, is let me set this out by saying that if the media, if the media had given many of us, I mean, there were there were Americans, there were orphanages all over South Vietnam, and many units even today are still supporting, like I'm supporting mine, there were many. And, but if the media back then, and all that mayhem and all that opin opinionated, this is bad, it's bad, it's terrible. It's, if they gave us a couple of seconds, once or twice a week, shine the light on Mang Lang Orphanage. Shine a light, not me, go to Mang Lang and show the kids being spoon fed and playing baseball. Go to watch the people, the, the Navy guys uh, that were dealing with the civilians, uh, uh, treating the children. Uh, so uh, we might not have been treated as poorly as we were. Mm -hmm. So what I would like, what I would like people to know, and if this story ever does get to film, I don't know if it will, a lot of people are saying it deserves to be a movie. Uh, but I, I want people to know, and, and, and whenever I do my book signings, which I haven't done in a year, thank you, COVID. Mm -hmm. But uh, whenever I do these events, I, I talk to the audience and I say, I want people to understand that the American soldier, with the men and women, especially the nurses, were absolute. There's a heaven, there's a big part of heaven reserved for our nurses that were work tirelessly 12 hour shifts that cared and comfort for those of us that were wounded and sick. And, uh, and I, would, I would like people uh, to, to know about the humanitarian, the heart of the American service people, because we had heart and there were plenty, plenty of good deeds done. Okay, well, we are out of time. I feel like I could keep talking to you all night. I think I say that every month, but I really mean it. Um, if we didn't get to your questions, someone in the audience, again, there will be a survey at the end with room for you to share feedback or ask other questions and to let us know what you thought of today's program. I want to thank Jillian Decker for running everything behind the scenes and Carrie Giannotti, our museum educator for running things on the Facebook end and our director, Sarah Taggart, and of course, all of our trustees and volunteers. And I especially want to thank you again so much, Mr. Terrell, for sharing your time with us this evening. And thank you to everyone for coming. Please my plan pleasure. to join us at, oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, it's my pleasure. And, uh... And uh, God bless America. And oh. God, God bless all of everybody who served in uniform. Amen to that. So everyone, please plan to join us at our virtual Memorial Day ceremony, May 31st from 11 to 12. Our next vet chat with Gilbert Whip Wilson is June 17th at 7.30 p.m. You can find more about these events and all of the other amazing activities of the New Jersey Vietnam Veterans Memorial Foundation on our website, www.njvvmf.org. We hope to see you again soon. Good night, Billy. Good night, everybody. Take care. <laughs>